Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk today. And um, precisely as Dr. Chow was saying, ultrasound enhancing agents is the new is the new term for ultrasound contrast. And for the exact reasons that he was discussing just now, um, in the past, people have confused ultrasound enhancing agents with the iodinated contrast from CT or the gadolinium enhanced contrast from MRI, which has some significant side effects potentially, um, as well as renal implications, which are not present with ultrasound enhancing agents. Um, so the American and the Canadian societies have both made recommendations that we sort of change our terminology a little bit so that our patients are less confused. So thank you very much. I find this topic extremely interesting and I appreciate the opportunity to talk. Um, I wanted to make the following disclosures. Just going to, sorry. That I personally have no financial conflicts of interest with this topic. I don't have any stock in any of the contrast companies. Um, and I'm going to be discussing things which, according to the FDA and other regulatory agents, are off-use label, are off-label uses for these types of ultrasound enhancing agents, although they've been studied for decades and are extremely safe. In terms of the objectives for today's talk, I'd like to discuss the physical properties of the microbubble ultrasound contrast agents that we are currently using for the enhancement of our ultrasound studies. I'd like to also review the applications of ultrasound contrast agents and describe some technical aspects in terms of optimizing our use for the um, enhancement with the use of these agents. Before I get started, I just wanted to acknowledge that there's actually extreme um, local expertise in this area. And so there are really some giants in this field who work right out of Toronto, including clinicians, scientists, um, engineers who have done a lot of work over the last several decades in terms of developing and defining um, the use yeah. of these agents, as well as describing their mechanism of action. Um, specifically and most locally to our hospital, I wanted to point out that Dr. Leong Poi is an expert in this area. And so, um, although I appreciate the opportunity to talk, I realize that some of the people in the audience know much more about this topic than I do, but I still think it's valuable for the trainees to have a little bit of an overview. Um, I also wanted to say that a lot of the material that I got from the talk, I, I've gotten out of some excellent lectures from the American Society of Echocardiography, um, which I've seen on YouTube, as well as some uh, additional publications, both textbooks and guidelines, which have been published by various societies. Um, and so I just wanted to make that acknowledgement and rec at the beginning of my talk. So in terms of the indications, so we know that some patients are suboptimal for the identification and quantification of their left ventricular ejection fraction. Due to both the window as well as their body habitus, it can be extremely difficult to find the endocardial border in order to optimally and accurately quantify the size of their left ventricle. Um, and so these agents have been developed and are uh, approved for the assessment of the left ventricular chamber for chamber opacification, as well as for um, other techniques that require endocardial border delineation, such as volume assessment, um, the, the assessment of aneurysms. They can be extremely helpful to better define wall motion and to look for subtle wall motion abnormalities. They can be very helpful in terms of defining intercardiac masses as well as thrombus, and some of the perfusion applications of these agents can help differentiate um, some masses from thrombus. They've also, although um, not FDA approved, they've been used for myocardial perfusion imaging for several decades and have proven some very good use in that area. Um, they've been used for vascular imaging, defining the vasor of the sorum, as well as complex plaque in different areas of uh, the peripheral um, arterial system, carotid, as well as femoral disease. Um, they've been used to enhance the Doppler profile, as well as they've been loaded with different agents for molecular imaging. So, you know, on the left in this image, we have sort of the uh, typical, you know, complex patient in which the endocardial border is not well defined. And so trying to accurately uh, define the LVEF could be very tricky in this patient, especially if we're using the Simpsons method to 
um, try to outline this and quantify left ventricular ejection fraction, um, especially at the apex and along the lateral wall. In this patient, it's extremely difficult to sort of define where the wall is and how much um, myocardial thickening there is during the uh, during the phase of, of contraction and relaxation of the heart. So the in the same patient, the administration of contrast, you know, makes this job much much easier. And so suddenly you have a border that you can accurately define and trace and come up with a very accurate number, which can substantially change and alter management and improve patient care. So these are just some still images which define some of the other um, chamber quantification and characterization processes that we just looked at in terms of discussing the indications. Um, so we have a patient in the top left corner who has some myocardial non-compaction. And on the non-enhanced image, we can see that it's very difficult to actually define um, the edges of that, um, of the non-compacted myocardium, as well as to dif differentiate it from other processes which could be present, including thrombus. Um, so the administration of contrast allows us to see all of these crypts and all of the, uh, the non-compacted myocardium in a way that allows us to quantify it and better define the pathology in this patient. In the image in the left bottom corner, we can see that we have, we're using perfusion. This is a patient with fibroelastosis of the heart. And so there's a, com a combination of non-compaction as well as thrombus within the heart in an area of the apex, which is moving very poorly. And so trying to define um, and differentiate, you know, is this truly all non-compacted myocardium or is there actually thrombus present? The addition of an ultrasound enhancing agent, which we can use per, for perfusion, allows us to accurately see the enhancing myocardium and differentiate it from the thrombus, which we see centrally and is pointed out by this red arrow. And finally, on the uh, right side of our image, we can see the same patient two years apart. This is a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who over time develops a left um, apical aneurysm. And so again, on the non-contrast image in this patient with sort of a large body habitus, it's almost impossible to accurately define the endocardial border. And you may in fact miss the diagnosis altogether if you're just looking at this single unenhanced image. With the addition of an ultrasound enhancing agent, we can suddenly appreciate all of this thickened abnormal myocardium that is at the mid cavity and apex of the heart with sort of that classical spade um, shaped ventricle. And this allows us to make the correct diagnosis as well as to follow it accurately over time, looking for changes in the left ventricular ejection fraction, as well as the development of this apical aneurysm, which is demonstrated two years later. So in terms of describing what this contrast agent is, you know, we are using microbubbles. Now, there's a sort of a negative association with microbubbles. Uh, we think, you know, from our understanding of deep sea diving that any kind of bubble in the circulatory system um, could lead to some kind of fatal and concerning embolus within the lungs or elsewhere in the body if it got into the systemic um, circulation can lead to stroke. This is the reason why we're so incredibly careful in the cath lab whenever we're exchanging catheters or connecting um, a manifold to a catheter for injection that we're purging the system of all bubbles. Um, you know, we're very careful when we hang IVs for our patients that we're not giving them a load of bubbles that could cause them significant harm. But the truth is these micro bubbles are extremely small. They're smaller than both the pulmonary and systemic circulation. And so they pass the capillaries without causing, you know, the massive obstructions and difficulties that are associated with these other conditions, you know, including embolus, air embolus and stroke. Um, these are typically on the size of one to four microns, so micrometers. And um, this is much smaller than the typical capillary bed, which has a diameter of approximately six or seven microns. And so these are very, very tiny. Um, they're often, uh, they can be monodispersed or polydispersed. So they can be, you know, a very, a very, you know, a single size, or they can be a, a small range of sizes, which can offer different advantages in different situations. And they're typically composed of a shell, which is some type of lipid. It's got a um, hydrophobic center and a hydrophilic outside, so it's a monolayer. 
um, which can be miscible in blood, which means that it mixes with blood and it's, it can dissolve in blood in a way that the bubble itself doesn't dissolve because the shell protects the inner gas, layer, the inner gas core, um, but it allows it to mix with blood in a way that it mixes with the circulation without clumping or causing difficulties. The gas is typically something that's in earth, so a polyfluorocarbon um, consisting of a carbon sort of backbone with uh, these additional agents. And the thing that's very special about this gas is that it's extremely compressible. So in general, blood, tissue, things which are in our bodies are very minimally compressible. So I don't know anyone who's my, like myself who's ever tried Spanx, they don't work that well. Our bodies are not that compressible, but these gases are. And so, you know, microbubble contrast agents are typically safe. They can transmit through the pulmonary and systemic microcirculation without being impeded. And they're sufficiently stable that they can get all the way through the body and reach the heart. So they can go through the sort of the right side, you know, go through the veins to the right side of the heart, through the lungs to the left side of the heart where we're trying to get optimal left ventricular opacification and myocardial definition. They, they create very strong um, acoustic signals, and we're gonna talk about the mechanism of how they produce those signals in just a little, in just a few minutes. Um, you know, as described, they're these encapsulated agents, which are readily detected by ultrasound. And so um, the capsule, which is the lipid and the albumin generally keeps the gas in for long enough um, that, that the agent is stable enough to allow imaging for the order of many minutes, but over time, um, you know, quickly breaks down in a very safe way and can be very efficiently, um, you know, the, the gas is exhaled from the lungs and the, the, the shell can be just basically metabolized within our bodies. And so it's, you know, it's a very, um, it's a very safe agent, which is very efficiently disposed of by the body. It's typically disposed of through the liver and the reticuloendothelial system. So it's not the kidney. So it's very safe in patients who are uh, dialysis patients or patients who have renal failure. And so uh, this table is just sort of describing different um, agents, some of them which are available sort of on the market. And you know, we can see that there's a lot of similarities sort of across the board. And so um, this slide is just basically demonstrating the behavior of microbubbles. They act like red blood cells in the peripheral system. They're you know approximately the same size and they can easily squeeze through the capillary beds. And so what we're seeing. Um, are basically animal models. This is a, in the bottom right corner, this is a rat leg, and it's showing, uh, there's basically a strong inversion pulse, which pops all the bubbles, and then we're seeing the reflow of bubbles from externally back into the leg, and we sort of see the enhancement of the tissue as bubbles flow through large vessels into small vessels, into arterioles, into capillaries, and then back through the venous system. Um, the graph is basically meant just to show that these microbubbles behave very much like red blood cells in terms of the speed um, and ease with which they pass through the, the microcirculation. So um, as, as anyone who's done any type of ultrasound enhancing agent um, contrast enhanced study knows, that our typical settings that we set on the machine have to be altered. Once we inject the contrast agent, we need to switch into sort of the contrast enhanced mode for the machine. And it's the reason is because um, high mechanical index or you know, large, strong, high amplitude pulse waves can pop the bubbles. And this is just uh, sort of an illustration of that. Um, this is a slide which is demonstrating um, some inertial cavitation. So we know that the mechanical index is a measure of the negative acoustic pressure divided by the square root of the transmitted frequency. It's just basically telling us the power or amplitude that we're depositing into the tissue. And so this um, illustration is basically demonstrating a single air bubble in the center, which is unaffected, followed by all these encapsulated fluorocarbons, microbubbles, contrast enhancement that we are looking at. Um, so we can see that 
you know, the microbubbles are sort of floating along. And as soon as we add that high mechanical index, so a lot of power, we cause them to pop. And so why is that? How does that work? Um, this is another example of high versus low mechanical index. And we can see that our attempts at imaging or defining the, um, the contrast is very limited when we use a very high mechanical index because our bubbles are constantly being popped. So what we're seeing is the inflow of new bubbles being popped by the high mechanical index and then sort of the sort of the blood with without bubbles in it sort of swirling in a black pattern or appearance. You know, for optimal imaging, we have to lower the mechanical index or the power in which we're, de we're depositing to the tissue. And at that point, we get stable sort of oscillation of the bubbles, which allows us to optimize our imaging. So when we look across different vendors, there's sort of different names and there's different ways that we activate um, imaging. All of these different vendors, um, whether it's, you know, any of the major sort of ultrasound vendors have their own packages that have, where they've sort of optimized on their machine, um, sort of a different strategy for the imaging of our ultrasound enhancing agents. Um, so we can see that, you know, a lot of our machines at St. Mike's are, are the GE machines. So, and this is not a commercial endorsement, but this is just sort of what we're using locally. And it uses different pulse inversions and amplitude modulation, as well as a low mechanical index in order to optimize um, assessment of the bubble. So ultimately, what is that? And what does that mean? It's a method of controlling the artifact by um, altering the dose of the contrast, decreasing the mechanical index, adjusting the focal zone of the field, as well as the sequence and the um, means of deposition of energy through our, through our probe into the tissue in a way where we are minimizing the return of signal from normal tissue um, and maximizing the return of tissue from our ultrasound enhancing agents. So in this slide, we can see two micro bubbles. These are encapsulated shells, which have our, our, our fluorocarbene in the center. And we can see that with the application of the ultrasound pulse, um, we can get oscillation. So the oscillation of our bubbles, which is releasing energy. So each time, each time this bubble oscillates, it actually releases a, a, a lots of energy back, which the probe can then detect and results in enhancement of our image. The oscillation is actually um, dependent on both the frequency in which we're depositing energy into the tissue as well as the diameter of the micro bubble. So we can see at the energy level that we're depositing with this, um, with this video that the smaller bubble is actually being um, sort of better reached. It's got a more optimal radius for the energy level that we're putting in, although there is still some oscillation of the larger bubble. If we were to slightly increase the frequency, we would see that there'd be a switch. The larger bubble would start to oscillate more, the smaller bubble would oscillate slightly less. And basically what's happening is that as the pressure wave goes through, as the pressure increases, it causes compression of the volume of the bubble. And as there is a withdrawal of pressure, sort of the nadir or the negative part of the wave results in an expansion of this bubble. So as we deposit tissue, into the energy into the into the into the tissue through our ultrasound probe, we're causing these wave fronts of compression and relaxation. So expansion of the tissue and so and while the tissue itself um, has very little compressibility, the bubbles, which are on the order of two to three times more compressible than tissues, they start to oscillate in a way where significant amounts of energy are released and returned to the probe which can um, significantly enhance the uh, visualization of these, of these structures. Um, so we see here the probe putting in a fundamental frequency of with the F naught, which interacts with the bubble. The bubble oscillates um, at, at the correct frequency. And we can see that there is also release of sort of higher level harmonics, which we can image as well. Um, basically, this is a, you know, this is a schematic, you know, illustrating sort of this concept of stable cavitation. 
um, with the release of energy that sort of mimics F naught as well as each harmonic of that uh, fundamental frequency. So, you know, the so the two major sort of uh, strategies used by vendors in order to improve the response, um, basically the suppression of tissue and the enhancement of blood, which contains the ultrasound enhancing agent, um, is this. There's a, you know, there's either uh, through pulse wave inversion or phase inversion, they can basically deposit um, sort of the, the probe can send out two signals where they have sort of the fundamental frequency, but also an inverted uh, wave, which because tissue has basically very little um, capacity for expansion and relaxing, it results basically, and tissue basically responds in a fairly linear manner at low mechanical index um, in terms of the reflection of the ultrasound wave, because two waves, which are basically opposites, are being deposited in the tissue at the same time. The response from the tissue is basically to nullify the signal. Um, however, the bubbles result in sort of a nonlinear response. And so, although, uh, so the response from the tissue to having the deposition of these two sort of inverted waves is to return a nonlinear sort of wave back, which when summated, you know, when the nonlinear response to sort of wave A is summated with a nonlinear response to wave B, we basically get a response which is also nonlinear. And so instead of canceling each other out, we do get a signal. And so it results in um, decreased signal overall, but we get a very, very low signal from the linear responding tissue, which is basically nullified, versus a bright signal from the blood, which contains the ultrasound contrast agent. Um, the other sort of uh, very clever engineering tr trick that they've sort of come up with is to put in um, power modulation through the uh, addition of different um, sort of low mechanical index waves and extremely low mechanical index waves, um, which basically perform in a very similar manner. The tissue responds in a linear manner while the bubbles respond in a nonlinear manner and we get suppression of the tissue and enhancement of the contrast agent. So in this image, uh, we can appreciate what's happening here is that uh, this is show, demonstrating the mechanism for how we enhance tissue or do tissue perfusion. So a very high mechanical index pulse, which destroys the waves and causes that inertial cavitation or bursting of the bubbles, um, basically destroys all the signal and all the bubbles that are currently within a tissue. And then we're basically relying on reflow through the tissue to uh, regain our enhancement. And this is just a modeling of how sort of blood flows through the tissues. And there's, you know, initially a sort of very quick flow through large vessels, sort of arteries and arterioles. And then when it gets to the level of the capillaries, we get a slowing of the flow. Um, and so it's just showing that uh, when we use this as sort of a perfusion, um, as a perfusion agent, the, the strategy is to destroy, you know, destroy all the signal, which is that bright flash that we see, that big yellow flash that you just saw. And then we see the slow reflow and enhancement and lightening of the tissue. So the tissue is initially black because, you know, the majority of the bubbles have been destroyed and there's no sort of further signal enhancement. But then as, as the bubbles sort of get return to the tissue through the large vessel and then eventually through small vessels and arterioles and then capillaries we can see that the that the tissue is demonstrated it's showing us a map of how the tissue is being reperfused and this can be extremely useful and has been used um, um, basically to demonstrate uh, issues in terms of infarction or ischemia within the heart and has been used uh, as a supplement for um, so for stress imaging. And so we can see that, you know, initially we can, we appreciate that there's a black tissue where this is after that high frequency, high mechanical index wave, which has destroyed the signal. And then that eventual sort of reflow where there is a, where all the tissues sort of appear light, more light, progressively more light as there is a replenishment of the bubbles and enhancement of the contrast through the tissue. And so here's an example of um, some different patients where there is, you know, incomplete subendocardial um, apical sort of 
areas which demonstrate areas of ischemia, areas of microvascular disease, um, which this is the same patient who initially came in uh, post MI with a STEMI. Um, there's a blockage of the, this was, this was a study that was done at different time points and there's an initial blockage of the, of the distal left anterior descending coronary artery. So we get this um, poor, poor, poor perfusion of the apex. Um, this is before, sort of during and after treatment. And so, you know, after, after treatment, there is still some microvascular um, disease from distal embolization after, after they've gone in in the cath lab and tried to, and opened up the vessel. But eventually this patient has uh, sufficiently good recovery and um, sort of some recanalization of those, of those peripheral, of that microcirculation with the growth of additional vessels. And there's sort of that return of perfusion to the apex as well as an improvement in function of LVF. And so <coughs> this is something that's been um, well documented and demonstrated. And they've demonstrated as well that patients who were in it, like who were imaged uh, with microbubbles and demonstrated um, in, impairment in the microvascular perfusion, despite you know having normal large vessels, they did worse over time. And, and this is just documenting that that the echocardiographic findings with ultrasound enhancing agents can actually be very helpful in terms of demonstrating prognosis over time. So patients who have you know, open vessels and and no evidence of uh, impairment in their microcirculation, no peripheral um, microvascular disease, they do very well. And then, you know, open vessels, but with evidence of peripheral embolization in the microvascular do less well. And clearly patients who have both, you know, central vessels, which are blocked as well as microvascular impairment are more likely to have a repeat event and to have problems down the road. Another advantage of these agents is the use and the potential use for differentiating um, intracardiac thrombi versus masses versus uh, things which are in, invading the wall. And so here we see different panels. Um, this is demonstrating a left apical aneurysm with evidence of a large clot that we can see at the left apex. And we can see that this clot has no sort of internal vascularity and it become and it's very black. There's no evidence of any microcirculation reaching the center of this clot. Whereas we do see that there is some enhancement of the wall. And so, you know, in this patient with a metastatic sarcoma, which involves a heart, we can see that there's diffuse enhancement. And so if you were trying to differentiate sort of clot um, versus thrombus alone, this is something that could potentially be very helpful. Um, and here we see a myxoma, which again is a very vascular tissue and is, is enhanced as well with the tissue, you know, along with sort of normal myocardium, which we see enhancing sort of beside it as well. You know, there are some other vascular applications. And so as alluded to before, um, people are using these ultrasound enhancing agents to look at the carotid artery to better delineate plaque, which is happening at the bifurcation in the neck looking for ulceration, um, as well as looking for evidence of any, um, if there's a microlumen or if it's completely occluded, which might change or alter management in terms of decisions towards surgery versus stenting in patients who are high risk and not optimal for surgery. It can be helpful in the distal arteries and the femoral arteries to demonstrate flow, as well as to look at pseudoaneurysms and differentiate them from you know, other structures and cysts which might be nearby and help with the injection of thrombin percutaneously for patients who have complications from catheterization of their, of their large vessels. Um, it, it's being used as an emerging sort of indication for the quantification of skeletal muscle perfusion in patients who have severe peripheral artery disease. And there's a it might be able to guide medical management and other surgical interventions with better accuracy, um, better um, sort of predictive value. And it's also been used looking at aortic grafts, looking for evidence of endovascular leak and other um, problems that could be occurring. Um, and it's been extremely helpful in that area as well. You know, the problem with uh, patients who have vascular disease is that they have vascular disease typically everywhere. And so for patients who have very 
impaired renal function where CT and MRI imaging is suboptimal because of a threat, you know, to further decrease their poor renal function um, or the potential for significant complications and side effects with um, systemic fibrosis with MRI and MRI contrast agents. You know, this is a very, very, um, you know, appealing alternative to try to better characterize this, the, their peripheral vascular disease, which needs to be followed serially over time. So, um, and this is just an example that I got from the textbook. You know, this is our typical, uh, you know, looking at the, um, this is a typical shot of the aorta that we might obtain sort of when we're in our subcostal view. You know, the image on the left looks fairly unremarkable if we added color. You know, I'm not sure what it would show, but as soon as we add the uh, ultrasound enhancing agent, we can actually demonstrate a true versus a false lumen in a patient who actually has a descending aortic dissection. And so we can see that the true lumen has a lot more microbubbles in it and is very avidly enhancing, whereas the false lumen has fewer bubbles in it. And we can see that differentiation and flow between the true and false lumen, which helps better define this disease. And so that's just something that's interesting and we might catch a hold of one day. In terms of contrast safety, it's interesting. Um, you know, we've now studied probably more, there's been registry studies, and if you add them all up, some of these registries have, you know, in excess of 4 million patients. So tens of millions of patients have been studied over time. Many of these patients have received ultrasound enhancing agents. And the general consensus is that there, is, there are very few deaths very few complications associated with ultrasound enhancing agents. There's probably a one in 10,000 chance of an anaphylactic or anaphylactoid reaction. You know, the reality is that any medication probably has, you know, something similar or potentially much, much higher. So one in 10,000 chance of sort of having an anaphylactic reaction, type reaction to this contrast agent. And so that's why, you know, we administer it you know, when it's done in a hospital, it's a very safe environment. We observe the patient for several minutes. You know, they go back to their, like, and, and typically by the time we pack them up and the porter arrives, you know, we've, we've observed them for more than 15 to 20 minutes after the administration of the agent, at which point the, the risk of any type of, you know, uh, any type of anaphylactic or anaphylactoid uh, reaction is more than likely to happen sort of immediately on administration of the agent. And so, you know, we're, we're doing a very good job in terms of monitoring our patients afterward. Um, there's a small sort of uh, association with back pain and with other minor complications associated with the administration of this agent. It's, it's real and it does happen, but it's got a very, very low rate. And in the past, well, there's been, you know, significant uh, concern that these pa that patients that were unstable in an ICU or in other settings were not sort of good candidates for this um, for this type of contrast enhancement. The truth is, um, it's been extremely safe, and the image on the right is actually demonstrating um, sort of uh, a large study in which they looked at how the administration of contrast in these different patients in MS ICU, in the cardiology ICU, outpatient, inpatient wards actually altered management. And as we can see, some of these studies actually demonstrate lower mortality in patients who have the ultrasound enhancing agent. And one of the reasons for this observation of lower mortality associated with the administration of these agents is not necessarily that these agents may or may not be doing something good for the patient in and of themselves, but actually by improving the diagnostic quality of the study, they're helping the patients avoid dangerous and ineffective treatments, either surgical or medical or other, and they're actually, you know, prompting people to provide further care that's necessary for otherwise unidentified conditions. So you can imagine that, you know, if a left apical clot or aneurysm was unrecognized and it was treated, that these patients do much better. And so the administration of these agents is actually both safe and um, associated with a lower mortality and improved outcome for the patients who receive these agents when given in the you know appropriate clinical setting. So um, this is just a from from the 
um, the ASC textbook, and it just demonstrates how the FDA initially had uh, some black box blocks warnings which were placed on this product, and we can see that over time these um, various warnings have been repealed and sort of taken away. Um, at our site, we use the Definity Contrast Agent, and again, I'm not endorsing that over any of the other agents, but I was looking at the product monograph for that agent, and it's interesting because, you know, they still recommend uh, avoiding to avoiding administration of patients who have a hypersensitivity reaction to the agent, so it makes sense. If in the past you were allergic or to any other contrast agent, you're not going to give it a second time. Um, they, they still have a recommendation against giving it to patients who have uh, intracardiac shunts, although there have been many studies uh, which have demonstrated that it's both safe and effective in pediatric patients with shunts um, without any additional you know, pulmonary or cardiovascular complications. Um, if we read the product monograph, there have been many animal studies in which this agent has been administered to patients who are pregnant, to, sorry, not patients, but animals, large animals, in sort of 15 and 25 time concentration uh, compared to what you'd give to a human. And there have been no associated uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes um, in, the, in, the, in these animals, in these animal studies. So there's no evidence of harm in pregnancy but it still remains a relative contraindication. So unless there is a, because there's no human data and it's never been studied in humans and no one is going to undertake that study, um, you know, the recommendation is just to basically think very carefully as to whether, what the indication would be prior to the administration to a patient who's pregnant. And there's also um, no sort of human data to demonstrate the excretion of this agent into, um, uh, breast milk. So in mothers who are lactating, you know, there are some recommendations which are not based on any evidence that they could pump and dump for a period of time, like 24 hours after the administration, although that seems to be like potentially very excessively cautious because um, there's no, there's been no demonstration that these agents are actually excreted into breast milk or that if they were that it's actually harmful. But, but it's something that we still uh, you know, advise the patients on so that they can make their own decisions. Um, you know, there are some really fascinating emerging applications to these ultrasound enhancing agents. Unfortunately, I'm not expert on these and I will be sort of further discussing them, but, you know, people have been using high mechanical index impulses um, so that inertial cavitation that bursts the bubbles to try to actually approve, like achieve uh, various um, therapeutic effects for these agents, which have demonstrated some significant efficacy. So people have used them to uh, in thrombolysis to try to break up, um, you know, distal thrombi emboli within uh, coronary vessels as well as the brain for stroke. Um, people have used them in molecular imaging where instead of putting the fluorocarbon inside. Um, they've sort of added various um, types of molecular um, contrast agents inside, and so they've done both microbubble ultrasound enhanced imaging, as well as then done PET imaging or other imaging to sort of better characterize various diseases within the heart. Um, there's an emerging application with targeted drug in gene delivery because, again, you can load these, you know, you can load these bubbles with any type of agent. And so in the cancer world, <coughs> microbubbles have been used to load them with various types of embolic agents as well as chemotherapy agents to try to destroy or further enhance uh, the killing potential for tumors. And it's, it's demonstrated some significant efficacy. And so who knows, that might be an application for the heart one day as well. So I just wanted to say thank you very much um, for your attention. I really appreciate the opportunity to kind of go through this topic. I hope that I've, uh, I hope that I've taught you something new um, and, and thank you. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And I, I think there's some people on the line who are really amazing and know more about this topic than I do. And I'm sure that they'd be happy to, to, to pitch in and, and also give their opinion as well. So thank you.
So thank you, Anna, for this very comprehensive review of uh, use of uh, ultrasound uh, enhancing aging. So uh, a new term that we're going to use with our patients. And so I just want to acknowledge that actually there's significant Canadian contribution to this whole field, especially uh, Dr. Leon Poy, who has made his career um, uh, based on uh, many of his uh, accomplishments, uh, one of his areas. And, um, and then also uh, on top of that, um, in, in our country, there's been uh, many different people who have contributed to this, including uh, actually uh, Dr. Eric Yu has actually published it uh, in the very early beginning. Uh, Dr. Burns from uh, Sunny Brooks, who's a physicist, who's contributed to it. And most interesting, there's uh, Dr. Wei, who was, um, was, um, um, who trained uh, Dr. Leon Poi, who was actually originally from U of T as well. And there are many friends uh, around the country, including Dr. Sharon Mowat, who's recently returned back to uh, Canada from um, Mayo. And uh, and also we have an Albertan group, uh, which is uh, John Ventroy and, and uh, Dr. Harold Becker. So that, that's been actually a whole series of Canadians who have contributed to this field. And uh, Howard, I think the field is yours. Oh, oh, go ahead. No, thanks, Chiming. No, it, it, for sure, actually, I think the, the Canadian contribution is uh, quite significant. It's reflected in the, um, the latest updates. And I'm glad you mentioned uh, Peter Burns, actually. So Peter is one of the, I would say, the, the godfathers of, uh, of microbial um, contrast, kind of the fundamentals. Um, you know, Peter's still, um, he's kind of Professor Emeritus, uh, so he's sort of retired, but I think he's still keeping his hands in the, in the field. Anna, that was fantastic. That was a, that was a tour de force. I think he covered, uh, you know, many of the different aspects, uh, including some very, uh, some very technical aspects. So, uh, fantastic talk. Um, just to clarify, I think um, uh, my understanding of the, the product labeling in Canada for the, the ultrasound enhancing agent, uh, it's, it's most just getting approval by Health Canada um, and getting the paperwork in. So we're in Health Canada. We're always a little bit delayed compared to FDA. So in terms of the in terms of the contraindications for shunts and PFOs, for example, I, I think that's just a it's just a matter of time and submitting the paperwork and getting Health Canada to approve the the change. Um, but we've been using um, ultra enhancing agents in patients with with PFOs sort of routinely. I think we're a bit more cautious with larger shunts, like uh, large ESDs, for example. Um, but, uh, but 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 for PFOs, we there's there's no concern. Thank you very much for that clarification. Just to just to give you a bit of more uh, historical perspective to my colleagues, especially the fellows around. Um, when when I walked into the field of echo, there was a period when when echo contrast was first introduced into. Um, the clinical practice, and uh, as Echo Fellow, there were research projects, and Echo Fellows were used as uh, guinea pigs for um, testing the uh, contrast as well as um, uh, the machine setting. <laughs> I don't know about Howard, but I, I certainly had multiple of them tried on myself, and uh, <laughs> good looking hard <laughs> back then. <laughs> and uh, not to mention, like we we do our own stress echo on ourselves, so that you know we can demonstrate that as well. But um, so I had uh, like, you know, optics on, which was like supposedly like, you know, has possibility of prions. But, but nowadays with all the new contrast agents, uh, they're no longer using any milk protein. So, so it's much safer. But the original ones actually has milk protein and, and prion was, was actually a big topic um, back, back in those days, about 20 years. You know, just on the historical perspective, Chiming, you know, you and I trained in, a, in, a, in the same era, right? So I think you know, we were both training at the time where contrast was just in its infancy and stress echo was in its relative infancy. So we're there at the beginning, which is which is kind of cool. Like when when Anna talks about some of the contrast specific imaging techniques like pulse inversion and power modulation, I remember testing some of these for the first time in, in animal models at, when I was at University of Virginia, um, seeing the enhanced uh, contrast effect and looking at perfusion. Um, feeding back to the engineers and, and then and then um, having them um, uh, 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 make corrections, etc. Um, which is, um, I think it's a fantastic historical perspective. Uh, you know, I think some of our colleagues who are much more, more senior remember the transition from M mode to 2D echocardiography and then the introduction of color Doppler. And um, you know that was probably quite an amazing era as well, <laughs> where you where, where where Echo really took a, a big leap. So um, I have to admit it's a nice um, it's a nice um, 
it's, it's it brings back uh, a lot of good memories when you when you show those slides uh, and it brings back memories of my training any any That's comments amazing. on any of our colleagues I feel lucky that we're in an era where we don't test as many drugs and new materials on residents and fellows. I think that's <laughs> I brought that on to say that we, we should consider that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't think it's it's getting this. Back back then there was uh, the rules were more loose, let's put it that way. But I don't think we'll ever go back to that. Um no. so that's great. So, um, yeah, another another historical interest um, is actually Dr. Robinson, uh, one of our uh, colleagues. Uh, uh, when I first stepped in into uh, St. Mike's, um, uh, and uh, he, he actually showed me a machine that we had in our office before our move. It actually looks like you know, one of these things that you buy from like um, um, the kitchen place, where it's actually a shaker. So he he would actually mix up all these bubbles, and that's one of the um, first study that he did. And uh, he he would go down to I think um, you know to the um, uh, to the blood bank with like you know albumin, and you would actually shake them up like with one of those like almost like a cappuccino machine that actually shake them up. And I don't know what he was doing with that, but uh, he, he showed me that machine, and we had it in the office for like some time. No, I remember seeing that. It, it, it was a uh, was one of the early early um, sonicator devices. Yeah. Maybe uh, it's Bob. Bob. Guys, um, what if you comment about the use of uh, contrast for myocardial perfusion? I mean, we're, we're using it for for LV, you know, see the LV wall, you know, thrombi, that sort of thing. But we're really not looking at myocardial perfusion. So, what what's our what's your take on that? Obviously. Uh, um, the literature talks about it, but we don't really do it. Yes, Anna, do you want to do you want to take a stab first, and I'll add, or what, in terms of your read? Um, you know, I think that I think that uh, I think that we have. You know, I I think that it's a technique that's an excellent technique, and it takes a lot of. Um, intense work and expertise at the level of the lab, and I think this lab would be more than capable of doing that type of imaging. I think that, uh, you know, as a whole, I think that in the community, um, some of the other techniques like radiation involving techniques like nuclear medicine are a little bit more sort of um, push button in terms of getting them to work and, and doing the Q&A on them. So I think, I think that the reason why myocardial imaging perfusion with echo contrast agents is not as popular as you know nuclear medicine contrast agents is that um you know i think that at the level of the lab it takes a lot of uh, time expertise and like quality assurance in order to make sure that you're uh, consistently and persistently doing a great job and I, I definitely think that we have amazing people here i think that st mike's could do it without breaking a sweat but i think that it would be very difficult to do with high fidelity you know, in the community, and and I think that's why it's less popular. It's my impression. Yeah, no, I think some of that's definitely true, Anna. Um, you know, Bob, it's a it's a very complex question. It gets asked regularly, um, and unfortunately, the the longer the 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 more time goes by without becoming um, you know clinically uh, used at least routinely, the you get the feeling the less likely it'll it'll happen. There are probably a few labs that are doing it. Um, fairly routinely clinically, but they're, they're, they're few and far between. Uh, Tom Porter's lab, for example, uh, at Nebraska, Roxy Senior at the Royal Brompton uh, in London are using it clinically, and they're using it mostly as an addition to stress echo um, uh, for perfusion on top of wall motion. Um, and just to add to some of the things that have been sort of barriers, I guess the main barrier has really been, um, has really been um, reimbursement. <laughs> For um, for uh, perfusion per se, as opposed to LVO, uh, I think that's been a huge um, barrier in the U.S. Where you know it's really all it's all it's all driven by by billing, right? In terms of any clinical activities, um, there is there is a code now that they're using since the introduction of those of that 2018 guidelines, where they're tracking the use of these contrast these ultra ultra enhancing agents 
for perfusion, I think with the hope that eventually they'll get approved for some degree of funding or reimbursement um, uh, from the payers uh, for perfusion. So they're, they're definitely tracking that. Uh, uh, and, and I agree with that. And I think the, the additional technical aspects uh, to doing contrast perfusion on top of everything else that we do in an Equilab, I think would be would be another another challenge. Um, I, I would I, I think some would argue that uh, that if contrast perfusion uh, had come up before nuclear uh, tracer perfusion imaging, it would be the the the, the it would be um, the, the perfusion technique of choice now. Uh, but as a uh, competing against a, an established perfusion technique that's been readily accepted and um, and reimbursed, uh, it's it's a, it's just another challenge. Um, and and finally, I guess just from a political standpoint, I can tell you there was huge challenges from from medical imaging societies and uh, uh, over uh, use of ultra enhancing agents for perfusion, just because it's such a competitive market. So. Well, what do you think about those basal segments? I think there's always been a challenge because of the echo shadowing. Have, have we solved that problem yet? No, and the, the, actually the, the, the techniques that Anna talked about, I think have definitely improved things, but those basal segments, you have a basal lateral wall, the basal anchial wall, um, it's, it's always been a, a problem. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's sort of like, a, it's, it's sort of like the, uh, the inferior wall diaphragmatic attenuation on, uh, on uh, spec perfusion imaging, you know, if you have good wall motion uh, with that segment, then we, we pretty much ignore it and call it an artifact. <laughs> um, I think that's how we overcome it uh, uh, with with contrast perfusion. Right. Maybe just a, a comment again for me. I don't think we do enough uh, flashing for uh, nice wall delineation. Um, you know, on the stress echoes, you know, I, you know, I see a lot of them where I thought, gee, it would have been nice to flash this. Where the the wall, the border definition is is not as good as it might be. Yeah, I, I agree with it completely, Bob. I think uh, I think we we need to do more often, especially when the myocardium is very bright. Um, it really makes it dif difficult to to see the borders, um, and I think we should definitely use the flash. A little bit more. Obviously, you don't want to use it too much because you destroy the agent that you you have to give a little bit more after. But yes, I think I agree with you completely. Yeah. Well, I think a, a plea and the um, and the uh, and the urge uh, of our echo um, sonographer uh, to help us to flash the image um, uh, uh, to to before we actually acquire the image for tracing the senses. This is something that we talked about almost every single or every other. Uh, accreditation round because it actually makes the border so much easier between the myocardium and and the and the uh, actually the inside cavity uh, of the LV. So you know with the myocardial contrast, it makes our life really hard. And uh, please remember to flash it before you take the picture for us to to trace the myocardium. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, Bezna so yeah, um, had, had sent an email to the attendees round for for talks. So I was going to talk about. I don't know if you guys remember, I did a talk on, on LVEF quantification, very practical pre-COVID. I was going to come back again and just talk about some of these things and show some, some nice examples where, where we do a fantastic job and some, some examples where it's a little bit more challenging. That's great. So without further ado, maybe we'll give you back a few minutes in your day. And uh, certainly the Echo Lab is getting busier. And uh, thank you, Anna, for such comprehensive review. And thank you, everyone, for participating. Uh, if you have friends and colleagues who want to join us, please um, uh, send the invitation out and uh, or, or contact me, and then I'll get them uh, onto the subscription list. And I will send out the um, evaluation very shortly uh, together with the uh, video link. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful